All right. Happy Saturday, everyone. Welcome back to Cooking with Cole. Today we have more of a Valentine's Day themed class for you guys. So what's on the menu today is a butternut squash mac and cheese. And we're also preparing a fruit bouquet where we're taking different kinds of fruit and attempting to turn them into roses, essentially. So it should be a good time. It's fairly straightforward and simple, but some of the things take a little bit of time. So um, starting with housekeeping things, what I have going on behind me on my stove, I have a large skillet here that I started to sa saute an onion before class. And so I use sort of a smaller, medium-sized onion like this one, um, a yellow onion that I just had a little bit of a light chop to it. And then I drizzled it with a little bit of olive oil. And so ideally what's happening is we want the onion to become translucent. Maybe it gets a little bit of caramelized, um, ideally. And then to that, we're actually going to, I'll get to that actually in a second. Um, but the other thing I have on here that I did beforehand is I took shell pasta and I've already cooked it and drained it and drizzled it with some olive oil so it doesn't stick together. And when you, whenever you cook pasta, especially since we're baking this one twice, you don't want to overcook it. And so the texture we're looking for is referred to as al dente. And that is Italian for to the tooth. And essentially that's just, that means that the pasta has a little bit of texture to it so that when you bite into it, your teeth should um, physically bite it and then it doesn't immediately turn to like mashed potatoes essentially. So um, per usual, we also have uh, my cutting board is secure to my surface. I used a silicone hot pad and that suction just make sure that as I'm chopping ingredients that doesn't slide around. If you don't have that, that's okay. A moist paper towel works just fine. Um, and also whenever holding your knife, always be sure that when you grip it, that your uh, pointer finger hugs the outside of the blade and it's gonna make for a really precise cut. And we're actually going to really emphasize that today since we're focusing on a lot of knife skills. So, um, we're going to get moving right along to this onion that we're sauteing and I'm probably at like a medium heat right now. Um, I'm going to add in two to three cloves of minced garlic here. I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Well, good enough for me. And then also we're going to add in one pound of butternut squash. And so squash right now, I believe are in season and they last quite a while. So if you go to the grocery store and you grab a butternut squash, um, they're really fibrous and dense. So you need a, a fairly intense knife. And so if you don't wanna go through all of that work, I find in the freezer section, oftentimes they have one pound like bags of already, um, I think it's steamed butternut squash that are just frozen. And so I just thawed this out overnight and I'm going to go ahead and add this to the skillet as well. Cool. What's great about butternut squash is it's super high in beta carotene. It's that nutrient that essentially turns into vitamin A and promotes eye health. And it's also really fibrous. So you're getting a lots of fiber and added nutrients um, with this. I'm also going to add in three fourths cup of cream. If you don't have cream, you can use half and half um, or just with regular whole milk. I like something a little bit more thick and rich since this is going to be a nice um, creamy mac and cheese. So pour that in. Um, we have a question in the chat. Uh, do you thaw in the refrigerator? Um, I just did on the countertop overnight. So I suppose you could um, but I did not. That's a good question. So I'm just going to give us a quick, I'm going to try the heat probably to medium high. Um, how would you prepare fresh squash? There's lots of different ways to do it. And I think for this recipe, um, an option you could do is, I don't know if you could see, and you know, I'll bring the skill up here so you can see the, the pieces. Um, but this one, I got this one from Whole Foods and I think it costs like three bucks, but uh, a piece can you see on this camera is probably about an inch by a half inch or so. So that's the size of butternut squash you probably want for this recipe. And what you would do is, um, let me get a better knife. So you want something pretty substantial. So, oops, this is a got myself a little bit, but this you want a pretty solid blade. 
and a butternut squash, they're really dense. And what you want to do is you essentially want to chop it in half long ways. And then from there, I like to peel the outside with a knife. And then you just want to attempt to create bite-sized pieces just like that. And um, what you can do is drizzle them with some olive oil and season them with whatever seasonings you want. And from there, uh, you can probably bake it at, I would say 375 to 400 degrees for, I would say just until it starts to get a little bit of brown on the outside edges. And then you can use that in your recipe. So you butternut squashes, they're, they're pretty hefty. So you probably only need about half of it. Or what you could do is do the whole thing um, on a pan and then freeze half of it so you can use it for later. Uh, how much butter or oil did you use for sauteing the onion? I just kind of eyeballed it. Um, I probably used like a tablespoon and a half. So these are all great questions. Let me give this another mix quick. Um, so just as a refresher in here, we have one chopped yellow onion, about three cloves of minced garlic, a pound of butternut squash that I just thawed overnight, and then three fourths cup cream. I'm also going to add in probably, I'm just eyeballing it, but about half the container of this stock. You can use chicken stock, veggie stock, it's totally your call. Um, but essentially all I'm looking for as I'm pouring it in is that most of the contents of this are gonna be submerged in the broth. Oh yes, and just as a refresher for those of you coming in um, late or um, just trying to catch up, we are making butternut squash mac and cheese right now. Yes. And we'll send out the recipe after class as well. Okay, so I'm just mixing this up so that everything can get heated through a little bit more. All right. I turned up the heat because um, we're just we're moving right along. We got lots of moving parts. So as that's cooking and heating up, we're actually going to move right to our fruit bouquet. So right here, if you're wondering what this green piece of styrofoam is, um, I got this from a craft store in their floral department. And what we're going to attempt to do is make a fruit bouquet. And I have skewers here, just simple bamboo skewers that we're going to put the pieces of fruit on. And then what's fun about these is you can stick them in and they stand perfectly up, almost like you have a fruit garden. So I think what we'll start off with first is uh, the strawberries. We're gonna turn them into, as best as we can, strawberry roses. And I find that when you go to make a strawberry rose, the more it has sort of like this cone shape, the easier it is. When you have a strawberry that's more flat like this, it's uh, it doesn't work out as well, um, I find. And so I'm gonna try to find one. I've been eating lots of strawberries this week, trying to find like the best technique uh, to make the roses. And so this one looks pretty darn good. It looks fairly uh, round and pointy at the tip, which is what we're looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and take the skewer and push it through. I'm not even gonna remove the greenery. I'm just gonna leave it there as is. And I'm gonna push it through, try to show you this way, uh, the base of that stem there. And ideally I'm going probably about three fourths of the way up. I'm just sort of feeling it. And then with this, you need sort of a thinner knife. And this is a, a fish knife. You don't need something like this. If you had a paring knife, that would work perfectly fine too. Something like this is fine as well. Um, I'm hearing quite a bit of a bubble, so I'm turning this down a little bit. We're at medium high. One second, just making sure it's all even. Um, and then from the chat, um, the uh, the mac and cheese, is it vegetarian friendly? Um, I, I don't know, do you mean like vegan or? Um... So the the only uh, non-vegan ingredient in here we have is cream, but if you have a cream alternative, there's, I believe, like a cashew cream, um, or you could use coconut. Coconut would be great in this, actually. You could use coconut milk or coconut cream. Um, that is a fantastic substitute that I think would go really well with this. Um, otherwise, it's just olive oil, onion, garlic, um, and then your cream alternative. 
And then we are putting in dairy, we're, we're putting in cheese in this, but if you have a preferred um, vegan or vegetarian friendly cheese, you want to use, um, absolutely feel free to use that. Sometimes the melting of vegan cheeses is a little bit, um, it's, it's a curious texture. And so a cheese that I find that's vegan that works really well is a Daya cheese. I think it's spelled D-I-A-Y-A. -A. I could be wrong. Maybe the I and the A are switched. But anyway, that's a brand that I find is really good with vegan cheeses. And the flavor is pretty darn good as well. Um, but with the strawberry, or are there any more questions? I should say that. Um, Don, I, does that answer your question? Um, right now, there are no other questions. There are no questions? Okay, yes, yes. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so with the strawberry, we just uh, put it, took the skewer and took it about three fourths of the way up. I'm just sort of like roughly feeling it. And then I find when holding this, um, I'll cut the base here and I'll just set my thumb on the very tip. And I'm gonna try my best to show you guys how I like to do this. But you need sort of a, a thinner knife um, something that's either serrated or that's sort of tiny. This one's not serrated, but it's like very sharp. Fish knives, fish knives are very sharp. So you want to be careful. And again, keep in mind my finger, my pointer finger is hugging the outside of the blade, um, helping me with this accurate cut. And so what I'm going to do is probably about three fourths of the way up. Um, I'm just going to cut down here and stop about a half inch from the base. I'll try to show you what this looks like on this camera. It's a little bit clearer. So that's what we're looking for. And I'm just gonna go and do that same thing around the outside of the strawberry. And so I'm just sort of eyeballing it, being really gentle. And you don't wanna go down all the way. And so I find that four petals is the way to go with this. I'll do one more. Hopefully you guys can see okay. And they don't need to be perfect per se, um, but just try your best. There's a little bit of a learning curve I find. Um, and then essentially what we're aiming to do is to sort of create these flaps here. So you can sort of see if I just push on it, it's not enough, like there's sort of a lip here that creates this rose, um, but, or rose effect, but I find what works best is right where there's this, what is that, like a fourth or a half inch down on this on this pedal here. If you take your knife and make just like a really small cut into the slice of strawberry, you're more apt to have like this really beautiful curvature. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do that to each pedal. So again, I'm going about a half inch down and making just like the tiniest little horizontal incision so that you create more of this fanning and you get these fun petals. This one's a little bit too floppy, so I'm not gonna do it to that one. I cut it a little bit too thin. And I'm going in like probably like a 16th, an eighth of an inch. Like it's, it's really small. Like I'm just barely making an indent here. And so in between these two petals on all the petals really, um, I'm gonna go and do the same thing. And I'm probably gonna stop, I stop cutting right where this crease is here, roughly when I'm going down. And then I'll do the same thing on the top of this one. I'll do a little incision on the top just to kind of encourage that fanning effect. I'll do that around the whole thing. You know, be careful. And it's kind of meditative, to be honest with you. It's a good time. All right. So if you want, this could be enough. You know, you could stop here if you wanted to. But a lot of you guys have taken classes with me for quite a while. And so why not be extra about it, right? And so if you want to go that step further, <laughs> Um, what we're going to do, this is a little bit more um, of an accurate cut, so you definitely want to be careful. So I'm holding it just from the base here. And then what I find is with this tip, the very point of the strawberry, what I'm going to do is essentially do 
a series of four little uh, punctures where I slightly angle it towards the center, the, the blade towards the center. And what we're gonna do is attempt to like create a box effect just around the tip and just rotating the strawberry where we're essentially removing, if I can do it, let's see, it's a live show. So I'm going down probably a fourth of an inch or so. And I'm finding, you know what, that the skewer is a little bit high up there. So I'm just kind of rolling it down. So my knife is hitting the tip of the skewer. And then, one second. The root in that is a little bit strong. So now that the tip is off, I just plopped it off there. And then I'm gonna go down and make small little incisions, probably four of them. And then you're just going to encourage the fanning there. Gosh, and look at that. You have your little strawberry rose. And if you wanted to, um, you could coat these in uh, powdered sugar and you could even, if you really feel inspired, and let me grab it quick, I don't know where it is. Let me set this in our little stand that we've made. Look at that. The squeaky door. Oh, where did I put it? There's such thing as um, it's sort of like this sparkly sugar. It's just sugar granules that are really clear and shiny. And what you can do is um, just sprinkle some of this over um, on top of the strawberry, and you have like this glistening effect that I think would be really fun and cool. Um, so that is the strawberry. Can we rose. Get a close up of the rose on your um, wow. on your the cooking camera. Let's see. Oh wow! Look at that. That's wonderful. Isn't that fun? It doesn't take a super long amount of time. Um, you just got to be patient with it. I tried like five different versions of the rose before this class, and this one's my favorite. Um, so you want the bigger petals on the outside, and then I find that three tiers is good. The thinner knife, you know, it, it's easier to be really accurate with it. Um, otherwise, if you have something thicker, I tried it with like this size, and it was fine. It just, it didn't, the the look wasn't as, as accurate as I was going for. Um, so something a little bit thinner. If you have a, a thinner blade, I find that's gonna work best. Um, I'm just gonna check out my butternut squash and it's really moving. So you know what, I'm just gonna cut the heat because it's done cooking completely. So we're good here. And I'm just gonna set it to the side quick. We'll tackle this the next step in just a moment. Uh, but I want to show you what I want to do for the kiwi. The kiwi is really fun and simple. So I'm going to use this blade. It has a serrated um, edge. And what I'll do with a kiwi is I'll just chop off uh, both ends. So I'm going in about a fourth of an inch or so. And I'm going to discard these pieces. So on this one, um, I'm gonna try to show you, it's a little bit trickier um, from the angles we got working with, but I'm gonna go about a third of the way down on the kiwi, and I'm going to make a 45 angle, um, essentially like a puncture, where I'm gonna take my knife and go about halfway into the kiwi. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like here in just a second. I'm trying to angle myself so you can see. So I'm about, I'll go this way, like halfway, or sorry, uh, a third of the way down and just kind of eyeball the angle. You can take the angle of your knife. Um, you can see we're essentially making a bunch of different triangles. And then I'm just going to puncture in and uh, I'm feeling that I'm kind of towards the, the center. And then what I'm gonna do, I'll show you on this camera. So we have this 45 degree angle here. Can you guys see that all right? Hopefully. And then I'm going to rotate it um, so that I do the same thing and I'm just pushing it in kind of roughly eyeballing it toward the center. I'm just moving back and forth and feeling it through the whole thing. And so I find that slightly underripe kiwis are the easiest 
to achieve uh, this effect. If they're too underripe, um, the kiwi oxidizes and the, the taste is kind of funky. And so hopefully you guys can see, I'll show you um, before I open it up on that camera in just a moment. So if you uh, want to be more active with your cuts, I'll show you right now. Um, you can see, hopefully, these series of like zigzaggy triangles we got going on. And so when I am to help guide my hand, I can take the angle of my blade and just sort of um, eyeball it there. I'm just kind of feeling all the way through. Try to rush this a little bit more. It takes a little bit of time, but not too bad. All right, we're almost done. Oh, this is great. All right, looks like two more. You guys are going to lose it. Okay, so you can see that I've created these little triangles around the whole kiwi and then get a load of this you just lift it up and you have how cool is that wow look at that isn't that fun and we're not done yet <laughs> so what you can do is take i'm going to use my other knife actually um i'm just what i'm doing is i'm essentially cutting the lips of the these, these points here, these little triangles. And the same thing I did with the strawberry where I kind of took the blade and made that little horizontal incision to encourage the fanning. Um, I'm gonna do that here and just do a little bit. So it kind of just goes to the bare edge of um, the skin and you're gonna push it out. And the skin on the kiwi is pretty um, strong. And so feel free to really kind of push it down um, to create the petals of the kiwi. And so you're just going to do this around the whole thing. And what we're essentially achieving are these little flowers from the kiwi. So each kiwi is going to have two pieces, you know. So um, if you got a pack of like five kiwi, that's 10 flowers. And kiwis are so cheap right now. You can get a, a whole bag of them. Um, I think for, I got a, a bag of five for three bucks. Um, how is your saute pan going, by the way? Oh, so again, I took it off of the heat um, because I was it was really boiling. Um, so we're uh, we're totally cooked through. Um, and I'm going to show you essentially step two after we finish the kiwi. But okay. yeah, I'm glad you guys said that because uh, really all we're trying to achieve is that the um, the butternut squash is cooked all the way through, and because it's so fibrous, it breaks down fairly easily, which is actually what we want. Um, so once it kind of gets like a simmer going on, you're good to cut the heat and set it to the side. And so it's actually good too um, that we set it aside because we're actually going to blend it up. And so we need the temperature of it to get down to a little bit more of a reasonable cooler temperature before we put it into a blender, depending on what kind of blender you have. Um, if your container is glass, then you're good. Um, sometimes the plastic ones, you gotta be careful. Um, that it's not too hot before you blend it up. Um, but anyway, what we're going to do with this kiwi is you can just sort of push these petals down. Oh, I'm so happy with this. So are you just cutting um, the skin off to do that? Um, or um, are you cutting through the um, fruit as well? So what I'm doing, I'll, I'll show you on this camera because I think it's a little bit clear. So I left I'm, I'm going into like the meat of the kiwi a little bit. You can see that these okay. points here, there's probably like, what is that? Like an eighth of an inch or so of like the meat that's still on the kiwi. Um, and it's just really on the outer edge of the point. So the one that we haven't done. Okay, okay. Does that so you've got most of the fruit intact, but you've got a little bit that's left on the skin for the petals. Correct, yep. Okay. Um, and they keep up pretty darn good. And again, if you wanted to, um, you could sprinkle on some of that like fun, uh, like sparkly sugar, and that would just be totally fine. And so I'm gonna grab another skewer, and you've got to be a little bit careful 
about it because you don't want to go all the way through. What's the sugar called in the store? Um, gosh, the name is escaping me. Uh, it's, it's it, it, like, it literally is something like sparkly, like sparkle sugar. Okay. Um, or like decorating sugar. You can get it at Michael's. I got mine at Target. Um, I haven't seen it at Giant. I guess I haven't really looked for it at Giant or Harris Teeter. Um, but yeah, it's usually in like that baking section and it's not a must, but it's just fun. And they come in all these really cool colors too of like blue or red or pink, like whatever you want. Um, and you know what, I'll find the link and I'll send it, I'll, I'll email it to you. Um, okay. Where I got mine, because it goes by a couple different names. Um, it's like a sparkle sugar and then there's like another one. I think it starts with a D. But anyway, I'm sorry, I should have been a little bit more prepared before I brought it up. Um, but anyway, isn't that fun? Um, can you eat the kiwi skin? That, okay, so I, I've heard from so many people that you can, and I Googled it before the class and apparently it's edible. Um, the texture for me is like not my favorite thing, um, but for like display, it's perfect. Um, otherwise, what you could do is just trim along, like once you get to this stage, um, I suppose you could just trim around the perimeter, just be, you know, make sure um, that you do a, a decent job because depending on how firm or, or ripe your kiwi is, it could kind of mash up. So just, you know, be cautious of that. Um, so yeah. Okay. If you want to then... you can, but that's up to you. Um, and then we've got uh, questions about the squash. So um, if we buy a whole butternut squash, um, you mentioned dicing and baking at 375. Um, how long for? Just, you have to keep an eye on it because every oven's a little bit different, but essentially we're just looking for a little bit of browning happening. Um, because again, the butternut squash is so fibrous, sometimes depending on like where it is in its like ripening stage, it, it will take shorter or longer. But the main thing you want to keep an eye for is just when it becomes soft and when it's soft and slightly brown, then you're good. Um, you want to make sure that every piece is covered in some sort of oil, um, ideally something with like a higher smoke point. So avocado, coconut, um, a virgin olive oil, not an extra virgin. Uh, there's a grape seed. There's a few that you can choose from, butter. Uh, and then you can season it however you want to. Um, but I would probably stay with just like salt, pepper, and maybe some sort of, you know, like savory herb, like thyme, or rosemary, sage even. Sage is actually fantastic. Um, I think this recipe would really do good with some sage. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, and again, you just want the pieces to be, uh, the smaller pieces are going to cook faster, larger pieces take longer um, with, with cooking butternut squash. And I also found too, um, whenever you bake any sort of vegetable, the more crowded the pan is, the less apt you are to have a sort of Maillard reaction, which is that crusty caramelization that sometimes people are really looking for. So like when you're making Brussels sprouts, if you overpack the pan, um, what happens is the moisture that's released from the Brussels sprouts actually steams them and doesn't actually create that crunch that you're looking for. So it depends on like how you want your butternut squash texturally to taste like. Um, if you want more of like a crunch and a, a, a crispiness to it with like a softer inside, do smaller pieces spread out on a baking sheet. Um, but if you want something that's just essentially soft that you know that you're just gonna puree anyway, you can do a slightly larger pieces um, and you can kind of pack them in on the sheet, but you'll have to cook it for longer as well because the pieces are so thick. So it has a lot to do, the cooking time has more to do with how big the, the pieces of your butternut squash are and not necessarily um, entirely relying on the temperature of the oven. Hopefully that makes sense. And um, for cheeses, um, do you have any recommendations for a good, less expensive substitute for Gruyere? Ooh. Um, yeah, you, gosh, so for me, I, Trader Joe's like really good deals on like very affordable cheeses. And so I believe I got a three fourths pound of Gruyere for 450 and then I just uh, shredded it. Um, 
but something cheaper than that. I but with this um, recipe, since we're making mac and cheese, you could do a mozzarella or like an Italian blend. Um, that would be totally fine. But we're, we're looking for something that ideally has sort of like an umami flavor. So, um, or not umami. Uh, so when you go to aged cheese, so right here, I have a, a pecorino um, that again is from Trader Joe's. But the, the, the more a cheese is aged, you get these crystals um, that are from the amino acid tyrosine. And the tyrosine is what gives it this it's, it's kind of, to me, it kind of has an umami flavor, but it's, it, you can't really compare it to anything else. Um, so depending on what kind of cheese and how it's aged, they have different profiles. And of course, different, when they inoculate it with different sorts of bacteria, you know, gives you a mozzarella or a Gruyere or whatever. Um, but Gruyere is sort of unique. It's kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it. I'm also not like a cheese connoisseur, so this question's a little bit tough for me. Like outside of like the tyrosine crystals, I'm a little bit lost. So uh, I, whatever sort of cheese you would normally use in a mac and cheese, in my mind, that's something like a mozzarella, and then you sort of get like a savoriness either from like a Gruyere or a Parmesan or a Pecorino. It, it's, it's totally your call. This is really customizable. Um, so I know it's probably not like the, the best answer, but um, also feel free to talk to the person at your cheese counter. They're really helpful. Um, so the, like, if you find an employee at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or Giant or Harris Teeter, the people working in their cheese sections oftentimes are really knowledgeable. So I would say ask them, um, for something that is potentially cheaper than a Gruyere and see what they think too. Um, cause they, they'll know more than I do. What about an extra sharp cheddar for this? Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, I like that. And then um, back to the squash. Um, can you saute the squash in the pan instead of in the oven, of cooking in the oven? If you're doing a whole, like a, an actual squash squash, I would steer a little bit away from it um, because the heat source is coming like directionally in like just a singular direction. And you would have to like rotate it depending on like how big of pieces you got. Um, it, it just, in my experience, it doesn't work as well that way. Um, you could, you just gotta really keep an eye on it. And so I would still probably encourage you to bake it first. Um, and then you can freeze it and use it later. But these are all actually really good questions. Absolutely. Do we have any more? And also while we're doing this, I should have, um, you can use all different kinds of fruit for these baskets. These are just, or sorry, bouquets. Um, you can use blackberries, mango would be really good. Uh, pineapple, citrus, you could do, you could peel some tangerines. That would be really fun. So like, this is, this is so simple. And what's fun too, is you can actually make a whole uh, afternoon of it. You can get the kiddos in the kitchen and they can, you know, skewer some strawberries and um, you can pre-cut the, the strawberries and the kiwi and then they can put them on a skewer and they can work on their fine motor skills depending on how young um, your kiddos are or your loved ones, I suppose. Um, so it's, it's really a good time. It's fun. But, um, and then I see super fine. Um, I don't know if that's, that might be referring to the sugar we were talking about earlier. Um, and feel free to jump in in the chat, Carol, if that is um, an incorrect interpretation of um, of your question there. Um, super fine is, I know for sure that this is not super fine um, sugar. I suppose that you could sprinkle it with a super fine sugar, but like for the look, I don't know, I'll try to show you that. Can you see on this camera how kind of like glistening and sparkly that is? And the granules are fairly thick, like they're thicker than um, like normal sugar, like table sugar. But I'll send the link. I'll, I'll look it up for you guys and uh, send it in an email and we'll get it to you. But it's just fun. And that could be fun too for kids just to sprinkle it with sugar. Um, all right, are there any more questions about the fruit or the, the squash? Um, I think we've conquered them all so far, but um, we'll be, I'll be on the lookout for more. Oh, um, how long do the sparkles last before they dissolve on the fruit? 
um, with your sugar? It's kind of quick. Um, they probably are going to hang out there probably not more than an hour. So it's more of a thing you want to do before serving it. That's a good question. And what's funny, when I was prepping for this class, I was kind of heartbroken. Um, I, there is this Vietnamese dessert called Tang Bulu. And essentially, uh, you create, have you guys heard of glass candy? We had to make that in like our home ec class in high school. Um, but essentially, you heat sugar and a little bit of corn syrup and water to 300 degrees. And when it cools, it basically forms like glass, like it's really hard. Um, and so what I attempted to do with this, I tried like five different versions of it. Um, but what I ran into every time, every time I went to go dip it in this uh, really hot sugar, so that it would have like this glossy effect because the citrus um, was exposed, the juice in it. Um, I believe the juice is citric acid in it. So it's a form of vitamin C actually. Um, and it's used as a preservative in lots of different things. But the hard part is that denatures the sugar. And because sugar is hydrophilic, which means that it, it uh, loves liquid and water, when I went to go uh, coat these guys in sugar, the sugar would degrade because of just the, the natural moisture um, from the exposed and cut open fruit. And the citric acid helped, uh, broke it down. And so I tried these experiments all week to try to make it work. Um, and I have one in the freezer. I could try to show you what it looks like, but um, it, it just didn't work out very well. Uh, what about sanding sugar? Can you say that one more time? Sanding sugar? I don't know that I've seen, I'm not sure what that is. That might, I, I would just have to see a photo if it looked like the thing. Um, but this is what I was attempting to go for. I don't know if you can see how it looks like it's just really glossy and shiny. And on this strawberry, you can see how it's sort of broken down in there. And on this side, it, the natural juices and citric acid are breaking little holes in the walls of the strawberry. But isn't that fun to do? The thing is, if you were to do this, you just have to eat it right away. But this is what I wanted to share with you guys. I want to do something a little bit more fun than just Wait, like- Is that sugar on the blackberries then? Yeah, yeah. So they're essentially like encased in, it looks like glass, right? Um, but it's just sugar, like there's a crunch to it. You can eat it. Oh, cause it looks like it's dipped in chocolate. Mm -mm, it's just so dark um, in the lighting. I don't know, it's, it's sort of difficult to see. Okay. But I'm gonna set these off to the side here. Actually, I'm just gonna send them back in the freezer. But um, Lisa, I don't know if you wanna clarify um, on, on your question. Is there a question? Um, is uh, I was just asking a follow up about the sanding sugar. Um, if if you if you do, um, we can certainly um, follow back up on that. And if not, then um, we can um, see what what the rest of the recipe holds. Yeah. Okay. So now that our our fruit bouquet is essentially done, um, you would just do this a bunch of times and you know stick it in your foam and essentially you have this fruit garden and it's it's beautiful and fun and this fruit lasts for a little while you probably want to eat it you know same day and you can store it in the fridge um keep in mind again if you uh, do put on the sugar that it's gonna um it probably won't last a super long time probably around a half hour or so before it looks kind of drippy and goofy um so just keep that in mind otherwise the fruit is just totally fine as is um, and it's still beautiful and pretty. So now that our butternut squash is cooked through with the onions and garlic and cream and stock, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer it over into a blender. And so I'm going to attempt to do this. It's a little bit tricky, so bear with me because the skillet is so gosh darn big. I don't want to splatter on me. going to be finicky. Just hang tight. This is a live show, folks. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so back to the sanding sugar. It's another large crystal sugar um, between white granulated and coarse sugar in size. Um, it's another decorating sugar and comes in many colors, reflecting light and giving off a sparkly shine. Well, gosh, that's probably what it's called then. Yeah. That sounds about right. Thank you. have a few casualties, thank goodness. I'm gonna wipe this off real quick. So essentially what we're gonna do is blend this up on high till it makes, uh, it's all smooth and incorporated, basically like a puree. Um, I apologize for the noise, just bear with me, or maybe do you wanna mute me for like 30 seconds? It's your call. Sure. Okay. There we go. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Thanks. Cool. Um, let's see. And then um, while we are um, working with the squash, we have another squash question. Um, um, I, I think that's the question. Is it easier to bake it first than cut? I wouldn't do that. Um, you would want to chop it first and then bake it. OK. Yeah. Because there's different kinds, like butternut squash, you could do that with because it's so, um, it's not as dense. And you could probably also do that with acorn squash, but butternut, depending if you have like the, so there's usually like a bowl in the center that's hollow or at the base. And then that, that top stalk is really thick. Like it's anywhere from like four to I've seen like seven inches thick of just pure butternut squash. And because it's so dense, it's kind of, it's difficult to go through. Um, but it's still great. Like it's really economical. Like you would for like one of our one pound bags of butternut squash, you could probably get at least three to like six of those from a single butternut squash. So many hiccups. Um, so it, it does save you money, but it also you gotta spend a little bit of time with it. So um, you just gotta keep that in mind. These are all really good questions. We'll have to do a squash class. I didn't realize that. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's winter time, so they're in season, so we should do it. That'd be a fun one. Um, so the, you can see on this camera, I've just pureed it. Um, and what's fun about this is usually when you go to make a mac and cheese from scratch at home, you do a bechamel sauce, which is essentially uh, flour and butter that you just heat on uh, a skillet until it kind of gets incorporated and it creates the similar texture. It's kind of like a roux. Um, and it, it, the, the flavor is just really nice and kind of nutty. Um, but the butternut squash kind of takes the place of that right here. And so um, everything is pureed and incorporated and I'm literally just gonna pour it right in there. With the spatula, I'm gonna get out as much as I can. It's so yummy. A little messy. It's a good time. It smells fantastic. I wish there was such thing as smell a vision. It's really, really good. <laughs> I'd be down for that. One of these days, it'll happen. Um, and then we have a question about using a uh, demerara sugar, and I apologize if I am butchering the pronunciation of that. Um, that's a, a sugar I'm unfamiliar with as well, unfortunately. Um, but to this, uh, what we're going to add in is this is the Gruyere that I just have grated and I just stored it in a bag. So I'm going to add that in here. And so that's about a cup or so. And then I'm just kind of eyeballing this. So I believe the recipe called for like a fourth cup of either Parmesan or Pecorino 
totally your call. I'm just kind of guessing it. I really like this stuff, so I'm adding a little bit more. I mean, who doesn't like cheese? That's a love language almost. <laughs> so to this, I'm just kind of eyeballing again, a few cracks of pepper. I love salt, so I'm gonna go a little bit heavier. And you're using shells for this recipe, correct? Yeah, sorry, I should have showed you um, what it looked like before, but you'll see it once I get it incorporated. Um, and I didn't put this in the recipe, but I really like it. Um, a smoked paprika, I think, adds just a really sort of robustness to it. I like that a whole lot. And if you're really feeling fun and fancy, um, you could even toast some pine nuts and sprinkle those in there. That'd be a good time, too. And so I'm just going to give this uh, a, a nice mix. And so I find when incorporating this, hope you guys can see on this camera, um, it's easier to sort of cut through it as opposed to like push the pasta together. Um, at, uh, am I making any sense? So as I'm going through it, hope you can see here, I'm kind of cutting it in and not pushing it this way, if that makes any sense. And so the reason I like doing that is because depending on how tender your noodles are potentially, um, you can break them. And so we're trying to keep the, the shape and the, the texture of the noodle intact. And so that's why it's really important to make sure that the noodle is al dente, you know, to the tooth, there should be some bite to it. And since this is going in, in an oven and the moisture from the, our butternut bechamel essentially is going to help cook the noodles even more. That looks pretty darn good to me. I like that. And remind me again. So you you've got a pound of shells, and you uh, cook them al dente before uh, incorporating the the squash and everything. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yep. And I just set them to the side. I drizzled them with a little bit of olive oil so that they would prevent from sticking together. Yes. Okay. So this looks good to me. Set my knives to the side here. And so what I'll do is you just need a casserole pan. And you're going to pour the noodles into your pan. This is really heavy. It's about as much as I am. <laughs> What's great about this too is it's fairly, this is like a fairly guilt-free recipe like sure there's cheese yes there's carbs but a lot the, this color the yellow color isn't coming from the cheese it's coming from the butternut squash and so this is packed with fiber um you're getting all of the beta carotene in there and it's going to add to like that really fun sort of i guess slightly nutty flavor um it's just this is a, you know this isn't a dish like necessarily you have to feel too bad about and I'm just going to spread it out as best I can, you know, just kind of eyeball it. Don't compact it down, you know, you don't want to, to smush it down. You want to have the noodles retain their texture and you want them to breathe a little bit. Cool. Uh, what size is your pan? This looks like a, gosh, I don't know, actually. I think it's like a nine by, I suppose a 12. I can measure it if you wanted. And maybe I'll do that actually. One we second. have somebody who's guessed nine by 13. I, that sounds right. <laughs> I believe it. Well, just the opening. Yep, nine by 13. You guys know your stuff. Okay, so this looks good. I'm gonna, I'm happy with this. And the next step is totally optional, um, but I'm just gonna sprinkle another layer of some pecorino or parmesan, whatever you like. But this one, again, it's from Trader Joe's and they price it by the weight of it, which is cool. And so you can get like a, a two or three year aged cheese that has those tyrosine crystals I was telling you about. Um, so this one was priced really somewhere. Um, Yeah, this one was five bucks. 
And so I feel really good about that. And in our household, this last, gosh, probably a little bit less than a month, um, we just kind of use it as a, a, a topping cheese. But for a recipe like this, why not make it decadent? You know, if it's for Valentine's Day, go all out. Um, next step, optional, but I think it adds a really fun texture and crunch is this is just an Italian style breadcrumb. Um, you can do your own breadcrumbs. You can use a panko crumb. What I like about the Italian is it has some of that seasoning in there. Um, in hindsight, what I think what I would amend is just actually use a panko because the, the crumb is a little bit bigger. And then I would just sprinkle the top with like Italian seasoning. Um, but you'll see, and actually before I put it on, I'll show you on this camera. Um, the, the crumb is, it's so small and fine and it's not unpleasant texturally, um, but for me, I think I want something a little bit uh, bigger. And so I'm just gonna sprinkle this on top. And what's cool too, is if you're in a pinch and you know that your week is gonna be packed with stuff to do and that you won't necessarily have a lot of time to spend in the kitchen, you can stop here you know, put a cover on it and, you know, put this in the freezer. And then when you're ready, you know, um, take it out of the freezer, probably let it sit for a handful of hours till it gets roughly, you know, close to room temperature. And then bake it for 375 um, from anywhere from 25 to 35 minutes. Just keep an eye on it. Um, you want the top to get sort of kind of crispy and you'll see on the outside edges, it'll brown a little bit and that's your cue um, that it's done. And depending on the depth of your pan, if it's, I think this is about three inches, the, the thicker the noodles are, the lower heating time for longer you need because it needs to cook all the way through. So if you use like a rough, you know, three inch casserole pan, um, you're gonna have a pretty even bake on this guy. And I'm happy with that. And so that's it. That is the butternut squash mac and cheese. And it's so good. Um, I made it this week to see if uh, I would tweak anything about the recipe. And the, the panko the, is the only thing that I personally for this would change. And I'm not kidding you, like I'm, I'm this big. I ate two thirds of this in two days. It's very yummy. I think you're going to like it. And I think I, that my computer is too far away. I can't see um, what's coming in. Are there questions? Um, how long um, for the pasta dish um, are you going to be cooking it for? Uh, again, so it's 25 to 35 minutes. Um, but I'm, I'm done with this as is. Um, so I'm actually going to personally store this in my freezer. Um, but you could, if, otherwise it's, it's ready right now to go in the oven at 375. And so you can just keep an eye on it to make sure that the, that the top gets a little bit crusty. Um, and there's some browning happening. So 25 to 35. Oh, we had uh, Carol in the chat um, suggest um, perhaps um, showing us how to make edible flowers like violets and pansies um, that can be candied for pies. Um, she also mentions that day, day lilies can be used in tossed salads, but are eaten as is. And she's eaten them on uh, pecan pies before. That's so fun. I also have seen there's a handful of like foodie, um, like bakery people that I follow on social media and just like general YouTube. Um, and a lot of people, because you can buy packs of edible flowers, um, like similar to those little um, plastic packs that you get your your like sage and rosemary and all those herbs in. Um, and I saw that you can take an egg white and you can just sort of use a brush and lightly paint them and then sprinkle them in sugar and let them like hang out overnight so that the moisture evaporates from the egg white. And of course you want to make sure that the egg is pasteurized, um, but then you have these sort of like really cool sugary flowers that you can put on pastries like cakes and pies and cupcakes. I have yet to do it, um, but I've, I've always wanted to. So I, I love that idea. 
Um, another thing, and you know what, I'll go grab it quick that we use for cocktails is I'll take citrus, like blood orange or lemon or lime and slice them really thin. And then I'll put that on a, a cooling rack, like a cookie sheet thing. And I'll put it in the oven. I think it was like hundred degrees and I'll just keep it. I'll probably put it in the morning and you let that hang out in the oven for six to eight hours so that they dehydrate. And then you have these dried citrus pieces that you can use for drinks and, I, and they're edible and you can, you know, put them in, uh, like top them with your baked goods, like pies and stuff. I'm going to go grab one so I can show you. And I'm going to uh, switch the view to see a closer shot of the mac and cheese. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay. And then um, yeah. let's take a look at these uh, citrus pieces. About. Oh yeah. Isn't that fun? Okay. Let me, uh, wait, sorry, let me put this back on spotlight. Okay, yes, if you can all see uh, that fruit there, it looks wonderful. Yeah, these are blood oranges. With lemons, it's really cool because it's almost like stained glass um, looking through, but I like the, the fun color of, of blood oranges. And they're cool in a cocktail because as the alcohol and liquid saturate it, some of that um, pigment goes out into your drink. It's just really pretty. So yeah, that's the class. This is our, our fruit bouquet. It looks small, but I'm going to keep on uh, whipping out some roses and some kiwi flowers as well. And then before you know it, you have a garden. And then uh, you can enjoy just like a really yummy, easy mac and cheese that's decently guilt-free, depending on how you make it. Okay, we've got some, uh, some folks who are excited to try the dishes this weekend. Uh, do we have any other questions um, from the chat or the Q&A? Oh, you're welcome, Katie. Um, yes, um, as I mentioned before, um, our next Cooking with Coal will be on February 20th. Um, so it's always a good time. Um, always wonderful dishes here. Um, so do you know what you'll be making yet? Um, I had talked about the last class doing something with pesto, but I, I switched it for, for today's class. But I think potentially the next class I'm gonna do something with pesto. I've just been really craving it and been experimenting with it for a little while. So I have ideas, um, but it's probably going to be pesto themed. Okay. Um, let's see. And then we've got a few more coming in in the chat. Donna, thank you. We appreciate the, the, the love. Um, let's see. Um, if you freeze the mac and cheese, should you sprinkle breadcrumbs just before placing in the oven or is it okay to freeze the breadcrumbs? That is a great question. Um, kind of gauge your sauce to see how liquidy it is. Um, so when it, when you go to blend the, the butternut squash and everything and it makes that puree, don't do all of it in at once. You know, see, maybe go half to three fourths of the way in and see if it oversaturates your noodles or if you, you can always add more, you just can't take it out. Um, Cause if it's too liquidy, I would say hold off on the breadcrumbs and just do it or to top it once it's out of the freezer so that they don't overly saturate and get mushy. I'm really glad you asked that question. That's smart. Okay. And then um, we have I'm, and I'm impressed with everyone's knowledge about sugar here, by the way. Um, too. The, the sugar, sanding sugar sprinkles are much finer than crystal uh, sugar sprinkles, uh, very similar to your standard granulated sugar. It sounds like we have a lot of bakers. So. It's great. I'm um, we have a request for tuna pesto um, for next time. Okay. And then uh, let's see, can you mat make a double batch? Um, and then um, you could you use two pans or use a larger pan like a lasagna pan? Yes, so if you wanna do a double batch, um, I have thoughts. You would definitely wanna do two pans. 
um, and you would also want to cook the pasta in two batches as well. So uh, just for record, this is like the, the size pot that I use to cook the, the noodles in. And when cooking pasta, it's sort of like the same thing as when you go to toss a salad. Just because the salad fits in the bowl doesn't mean that as you go to mix it, that it's going to stay in that bowl. You always want like usually the uh, twice the size container um, of the, the salad that you're making. The same is true when you go to cook pasta. And the reason is because um, the noodles need to have enough space to move freely and also enough surface area so that the water can heat evenly and cook the noodle. Otherwise, if you cram pasta into um, a, a pot that isn't as big as it probably should be, the noodles are gonna be uneven and the starch that seeps out of the noodles as you're cooking it, um, it creates just generally an unpleasant texture of, of the noodle. And so if you're ever in a pinch and like, if you know that people are coming over and you have like lots of mouths to feed, one of the, the worst things you can do, unfortunately, when making pasta is having more noodles than you do water, just because it fits in there doesn't necessarily mean the texture is going to be um, good, I suppose. Um, so don't over uh, pack your noodles, but make sure I would cook the noodles in two different batches. So one pound bag of the shells for this one, I, I probably wouldn't do more than that. And this is my biggest um, pot that I have. So I would do two batches, two pans, um, I guess two of everything. You'd have to do the, basically the same process over again. That would be my recommendation. Great question. Let's see. Okay. Uh, we have another. We have another vote for pesto. So it looks like that's a popular, a popular option there. Um, more, more appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Donna. Um, and then let's see, uh, Donna also gives a shout out to the friends of Beatley library. And, um, I will mention that because, um, the programs, uh, at the library that we host, whether that's cooking with coal, whether that's, um, uh, like for example, inviting authors to come speak, um, other, other programs, um, other speakers that come. Um, are funded by the Friends of Beatley Library. They make everything possible. Um, and so there are people in the community who, um, they also run our book sales that unfortunately we um, haven't had since March of last year. Um, and that's like the biggest um, fundraiser we have for the library. Um, but we are still, um, you know, you can still join and I, I believe we're still having meetings. And so if, you, if that is something that you're interested in um, being a part of, um, I can include that information in the, uh, well, let's see, in the chat, I think I can still project to everyone. Um, and so, um, so each branch has its own um, um, chapter. Um, and so um, that's in the chat, it's alexlibrary.org slash friends. Uh, and so uh, this one is run by Beatley Friends. And so, um, you know, any support is, is appreciated, but even just attending these programs is also um, very, very helpful. And uh, we appreciate seeing everyone here, um, you know, every every time we host the program. Um, so uh, for example, great, Carol. And so Carol comes from Pennsylvania for the book sale. And so um, back before, before COVID um, in March and in September, we'd have a big book sale to, um, uh, raise raise funds and it's uh, about a week every time and we fill our large meeting room um, with with lots of books of, you know children's books adult books bestsellers etc cooking cookbooks of course um, and so um, we we look forward to being able to do that once you know things can get back to normal but in the meantime we're gonna we're sticking around and we're gonna be here virtually um, as much as we can um, so, and then if you're interested in other programs, um, you can check the, the, in the link as well, alexlibrary.org slash events. Um, you know, we've got a weekly crafting program. Uh, we've got, I, uh, co-hosted a poetry program last month and we'll be bringing it again. Um, you know, we have, uh, book clubs, uh, we have something for everyone. So be sure to check and find something, um, that might be of interest to you. Um, so thank you, Mary. Thank you everyone. Um, for um, everything for for coming today and um, yep 
Um, so I guess if, if we don't have any more questions, I'll we'll take our final questions. And if not, then um, we will head out and enjoy your Sunday uh, pre-snow or yeah. Saturday pre-snow, so. All right, everyone, we'll see you all on February 20th at noon. Thank you for joining us for Cooking with Cole. Thanks, guys.